everybody, or for this episode, hello Gooligans, because this video will be the first of a new series of sorts. Thank you all so much for your patience on my absence the past few months, and those who are new, hello! I am Yuki Buns, your local pure of heart, demo best, Yuki Ona VTuber, artist, and commentator. My content is typically commentary on top of speed paints, and, and that will remain. However, I am taking a slightly different direction. Instead of just me talking, I'll now have new episodes that are more podcasty-like. They will hopefully be a little bit longer and help give you something entertaining to listen to while you work or draw or what have you. These episodes will be actually of me and a couple of my friends, Liv and Darrow who we are dubbing Going Baddie. Their info and any Going Baddie specific links will be below. The Going Baddie videos will be mostly about true crime or the paranormal, sometimes drama or what have you. But because of this, I need to put a disclaimer. Although I tried to edit this to be as family friendly as possible, what family friendly is may vary from person to person and some subjects may not be suitable for all audiences. Viewer discretion is advised. I also wanted to note in the future, if when I do solo videos again, you will see me, your ghostly pal, but in these group videos, the model will not be there. I did try to record us all in this episode, but it was genuinely impossible to keep it all synced up and it was just better to scrap it. But do not worry though, the speed pit remains. So in this episode specifically, I wanted to talk about a pretty heated subject. I know most of us, hopefully all of us, are familiar with the Black Lives Matter movement. George Floyd's name was plastered everywhere for a while along with many other black Americans, and for a good reason. Police brutality and discrimination has been a thing for ages, but I think a lot of us may have tunnel vision when it comes to the subject. The story I'm about to tell feels so relevant to today's political atmosphere, but this happened decades ago. I'm sure many of us watching and listening may not have heard of the story, as I didn't before I learned about it just like a month ago or so, but I think it's so important to tell the story. Get this person's name on everyone's minds. Without further ado, let's get into the story. Get ready to get mad. A young man in Guinea, Africa approached his family to tell them his aspirations of getting a computer degree. This man was Amadou Diallo. His mother, Kadiatu, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, applied for a visa for him to set off to America to pursue his dream. He wanted to make his family proud. The application was approved and before they knew it, Amadou was across the sea in New York City. He worked as a peddler of sorts, selling things so he could support himself in his tiny Bronx apartment while also saving money to pursue his degree. According to his mother, during their last phone call exchange between the two, he had saved up $9,000 for tuition. Karetu recalls his excitement over the phone, his happiness and assuredness that he was going to do it. He was ready. He was going to college. The family will sometimes think, where would he be now? What he could have achieved? Perhaps he would have become a teacher? What if he had gone to his apartment just moments before the police arrived? What if he had been anywhere else? What ifs may fill the air and float around indefinitely for forever, but the facts will always remain. Amadou Diallo is a man who is stripped of his opportunities, stripped of his life. His bright smiling face may no longer be physically present, but the fire his death lit into the hearts of many Americans still burns brightly, even to this day, and hopefully, hopefully forever. The story is difficult, but it is one with an ever-important message. February 4th, 1999. 41 gunshots, 4 officers, and 1 Amadou Diallo, who was 22 years old. He was standing in the vestibule of his own apartment. 19 of those bullets made contact with Amadou, killing him. He was unarmed, drug-free, no criminal record. Needless to say, this stirred an absolute uproar. Eyes were starting to open, so to speak, and people were getting upset. Just like me. Now let's set the scene at the time. Crime was a big problem in New York City in the 90s, and both Democratic and Republican parties running for mayor at the time were really pushing for a solution to that problem. There was a big political divide, but these candidates were neck and neck. It turned out that the Democratic mayor won. Mayor Dinkins. Dinkelberg. Mayor Dinkins. Mayor Dinkins. <laughs> mayor Dinkins. Mayor Dinkelberg. Dinkelberg. Who is the first black mayor in that city. Crime, murder, and assaults went down during his time as mayor. He was seen as a hero by many, but by many others, he was vilified. His plan was to create a civilian review board to keep an eye out over the police department, which 
wrestled the jimmies of the New York cops and those that vehemently supported them. Basically, the guy had the right idea and was moving in a good direction, but it was lighting a fire under some people. <laughs> in a rematch, the Republican ends up narrowly winning. This guy, Rudy Giuliani, was also out to put a stop or try to mitigate the crime that was plaguing the city, but he took a different approach. With his approach, the policemen were emboldened. They had a lot of power. They ran the show, so to speak, and with that, they formed a crime-stopping uni unit of sorts, a street crime unit. The best way I could describe this to you is their intentions were to stop crime where they thought it was happening the most often, to prevent the threats, so to speak. Which sounds good on its own, maybe, but this meant patrolling in areas that the police deemed to be dangerous. You know, impoverished communities, communities with a lot of minorities. I'll let you take that as you will. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't it, isn't it funny that, you know, 20 years later, just over 20 years later, that this is still a prevalent issue? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's just like nothing. Like how, how, okay, British person's perspective. How has nothing changed? How? Like, what is going on? That was my exact reaction because I didn't know about this story and I figured like, you know, with all the stuff that had been happening in the past couple of years, that it's like, we're just now kind of being like, oh, hey, this isn't cool. We should do something about this, you know? And then I find about yeah. the story like, oh my God, this has happened before. It just, it, it boggles my mind. And especially considering like, given who was the mayor at the time as well, how I just, I, I can't, I can't even comprehend that people like in, in, in 20 years haven't, like it hasn't clicked in their heads. Right. And I don't understand why. What I really don't understand is that there was how many bullets that were fired? 41? 41? 41, yeah. yeah. And almost half of them hit him. Yeah, okay, but the thing is, why 41 is an obscene number, between even between three people. Like, yeah. all your... Like, they were definitely shooting, like, in a frenzy. Yeah. Because there was no reason that they had to be shooting. Literally just one shot went off and then they like what like just lay into the, this poor dude for no reason yeah. i i really well, I mean, don't it's... get it it's just blatant murder well that's that's it was it was four police officers so four they police. each shot 10 10 shots plus one person shot one extra Pretty like much. that's and like the the type the type of bullets that they were using they were using uh full metal jacket bullets and those things, like, if you hit someone with one of those anywhere, like, in the arm, in the leg, you're, like, you're gonna put them down. Right. And was it an automatic rifle or was it a single, like, a single shot and then you'd have to, like, like, if you pulled was, the trigger, is only one gonna come out? Yeah, yeah. It was, it was, it was semi-auto. They had to they had to sit there and like keep pulling that trigger at least ten times. Yeah. And and while they're seeing this, they're hearing their other officers like shooting. This guy's going down, has nothing going on him, and they think that it's okay to keep shooting. Like at what yeah. point did they stop? When he was on the ground? Like were they still shooting then? Because that's what it seems like. It just seems like Yeah. Such an egregious oversight of moral values, I guess, just even on a, yeah. a personal level. Like, who can just sit there and shoot someone at least ten times? Yeah, that's bullshit. I just, ugh, I man, just I hate it. <laughs> yeah, for real. To sum it up in the least words, but they don't have the power that I want. I hate it. Yeah. <sighs> Like I'm, I'm still shocked that they were using full metal jacket bullets though, because those things just—they're really just—they're supposed to be public defenders, but they're really just trying to go out there and either you behave or you die. Pretty much. Well, it's it's to serve <laughs> and to protect, right? That is the motto in the U.S. Yeah, yeah, right? and it just feels like they want to—they feel like really super glorified, god tripping hall monitors. Well, <laughs> I think I, okay so I'm going to rephrase that some of them when I'm referring to officers like that I know there's a lot of like really good amazing police officers that do their job and don't do anything like this but when it really comes to those people just what the fuck yeah it just it feels like they take that whole like to serve and to protect thing as if oh yeah I'm going to serve myself and I'm going to protect myself it's yeah. not 
it's not in the public's interest at yeah. that point. It's in whoever they think is worthy of it. It's it, but it's almost like a form of like megalomania, right? <laughs> it's like the the power goes to their own own heads. Yeah. You know. Yeah. It's like I am in a position of authority, and I have this power, and I am above the law because I am the law. Kind of. You How know. Dare it feels. You. It feels <laughs> like. It feels like those kind of people that live with that mindset are the kind of people that would have loved to have lived in the Wild West. You know. That's that's what it seems like. <laughs> yeah. It's like oh yeah, they've they've got that 1800s mentality still. Believing in a and fantasy rather than a reality. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, America. What went wrong? America. What went right? <laughs> That's probably easier to answer than what went wrong. I know. <laughs> God, the answer is just nothing good. Nothing good. We had Betty White and now she's gone. Yeah, true. <laughs> I can't believe they stole Betty White from us. Wait, that sounds like I'm implying something that's not the case. <laughs> I, can't, I can't believe the New York police oh in the 90s God, stole no. Betty White from us. No, we went on a tangent. Bullets. Our <laughs> tangents are dangerous. They're gonna get us in trouble. <laughs> Out of this video, a lot of information I've sourced has come from the Wikipedia article, article on the situation, a couple of news articles, but also uh, this incredible episode from a Netflix docuseries. I'll try to link all of them, but I especially want to shout out that episode titled 41 Shots. I think it's really worth watching. And on top of that, this next bit I'm going to talk about comes from the episode. And while it is entirely possible it, it exists somewhere else and I didn't see it, I've only seen this next fella mentioned in that docuseries episode. Frankie Edozian. I tip my buns to the people involved in that series, but I also want to tip them to Frankie. He's a New York Post reporter and an immigrant from Africa himself, hailing from Nigeria. The New York Post saw him as a good fit for the story and sent him on his way to the scene to do some reporting. He finds out the following. The area around his door where he stood on that awful night was absolutely destroyed by bullet holes. Amadou Diallo was a West African immigrant trying to pave his way into the world and make his family proud. He had just come home from working, standing on his vestibule. For those of you like myself who have no idea what a vestibule is, <laughs> I had to look it up. It is like the opposite of a foyer. Think a foyer, but it's on the outside of the front door, like a little opening of sorts. Not really a room, but it's not like a full porch, but it's not just a door either, if that makes sense. Not super important to the story, but these various people saying it a bajillion times and I had never heard that word used before and I needed to know. And that also kind of might help illustrate the tiny space he was in <laughs> when he was is getting mowed down by these bullets. So this guy was standing in his vestibule, presumably getting ready to go inside, when he was approached by police in an unmarked car. Supposedly he had reached into his pocket to grab his wallet, which I presume he thought was the correct thing to do in that instance, but supposedly the police thought it was a gun and open fired. 41 bullets later, Amadou <laughs> was dead and here we are today. <laughs> I they always ask for ID. So why do they freak out when you go for your wallet? I, I have no sorry. idea. I'm, I'm mean, just always confused about that. It's like the, you would go. You're supposed to have that ready. Yeah, usually they ask for your ID. In my experience, there's there's, there's a simple. I mean, there's, there's a simple answer to that, and that's how many how many Americans own guns? Like. I, <sighs> You know, mm -hmm. like well, I, it's it's kind of like as keep in mind this happened in '99. I mean, yeah, even then, like it's not like yeah. gun laws have changed in the last twenty years. Mm -hmm. They've gotten probably worse, if anything, in the last twenty years, but they haven't changed. I would have to look you know? at current gun laws. It's very unsurprising to me when it's 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 a self fulfilling prophecy in that regard. Like you have this many guns available to the public, that of course, like the police's immediate reaction is going to be like, "Oh my god, he's drawing a gun!" Because anyone could be holding one. And I'm not saying that's like a justification for the police at all. Like they didn't do their job right, even remotely. Well, is it? But like. It's it's so stupid. It's yeah. so stupid. Well, okay, so I'm looking at a wiki page right now because I'm also trying to like get information on this while you're talking as well. And it was saying that was Officer Sean Carroll walked up to him because he mistaked him for uh, a subject of a rape crime one yeah, year earlier. Yeah, supposedly, yeah. Who 
was gonna remember. There's no way that he's gonna remember that guy's face from w uh, one case a year ago. Like, I don't, I just. I don't know. Not, it, I, it honestly I, just mm. sounded like they wanted an excuse. <sighs> that's that's that, definitely that's their like. thing that they're falling on, for sure. Man, it just sucks. I hate it. I hate it a lot. Agreed. Again, like, from, from the British perspective, because gun crime here is so rare. So, so rare. I can't remember when it was. I, th I want to say it was, like, in the 90s is when we had our like turn in your your handguns thing because before then you could america would lose their minds it, said all right like, turn in your guns oh it would be instant war instantaneously yeah but it's just like what everyone are you would go to... into a panic but like the thing that i don't understand is like what are you guys protecting yourselves from that's exactly what it is that's where the racism comes in like what like it was supposed it, to be for like the government, which was at the time, like the English government, it was like you're supposed to have. Oh, oh my god, I don't, I don't want to misquote the Constitution. Hold on. <laughs> It's like the, the the right to bear arms or whatever, the second yeah. amendment in the constitution yeah. or whatever. Yeah. It was for something like, so English troops could not come into your home and just boot you out or say that they're staying there. Yeah. You know, Google it right now. Stop to fact check myself. Yeah. Uh, um, imagine <laughs> freedom was actually a big deal back then. Like actual freedom. Yeah. And uh, I mean, the belief was that you should be able to, I guess, protect yourself because there's a, you know, the big deal about England and what have you having having a grip over what what we did and pretty much Thank you england we were teenagers and we pouted and said we should be able to take care of ourselves essentially and um and in 200 years <laughs> nothing has changed that's like that's the worst part of it incredible that's huh yeah it's it's just gotten worse instead you've just given the teenager like guns Pretty much. Like, we know how that turns out. <laughs> Pretty <laughs> much. Jesus. You'll blow your like, eye out, kid. It's just, <laughs> it, it it absolutely blows blows my mind completely. Because it's just, yeah. it's such a foreign concept to me. To be able to be like, oh yeah, I own X amount of guns. I can go to a Walmart and buy a gun. Right. Like, yeah, what? Yeah, literally. It, People <laughs> get me? so heated when you, like, threaten to take away their guns too. Like, that's the thing. Like, now, again, like, that, that kind of brings me back to my point. Like, what are you protecting yourselves against? It's not like there's going to be foreign invaders. You're not going to get invaded anytime soon. That's what their government is really... I feel like that's what people are afraid of. And that's what's like the biggest factor is. It's just people are just scared. And it's paranoia that keeps getting fed in like it's, echo chambers yeah. that people like get surrounded in, whether intentionally or not. It just sounds like stupid people breeding more stupidity. <laughs> and I think that's what um, a big problem is, is a lot of people don't know how to defend themselves. So they have to rely on guns. <sighs> Oh, there's so many arguments. It goes on forever. Yeah. It's something it's that's so very dumb. broad and you can talk about for literally forever. Yeah, that's why it's still a problem because it, like you'd think it'd be simple. Like you think it'd be like, just just don't. But I promise <laughs> you, if somebody is like a, a real a gun fan and they're listening to this, they'd be like, Well actually <laughs> about like everything we say. There's, yeah. And there's a lot yeah. of people that think that way. There's two sides to every coin, you yeah. know, and the truth lies somewhere in the middle. Truth lies somewhere in the don't kill innocent people. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Don't be a dick. That was a pretty big dick move. Yeah. Like the only way that you can dull this, this kind of heated flame that's going on is like, it starts from like, you, you need like a generation to like bring it to its knees. Essentially, you need like a singular generation to be like, no, this is going to change. But the problem is it feels like a lot of kids as they're growing up are so influenced by their, their parents. And like they take in everything that their parents say as gospel and following them. So it's just like, it's just that cycle. It's just a repetitive cycle. And then you get the fear and the paranoia and it just keeps on, keeps on circulating. And there's, there needs to be something to break it. My parents aren't like the greatest of people, but they're pretty liberal. And the things that they were saying to me make perfect sense, which to me is just like, I don't know, be a decent human being. 
being. Like, yeah, cost yeah. Don't be zero an dollars asshole. and zero cents to just not be a dickhead. And I, you know, a lot of my friends thought and felt the same way. I was shocked when I became like eh, an adult, and there's like a bunch of people that think the way that boomers do that are our age. It's mm-hmm. like, bruh, bruh. <laughs> What? Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Like, there's just, there are just some fundamental issues that, like, that, that I don't think will ever truly get resolved, unfortunately, because it's just, it's so deeply ingrained. I know that we talk about, like, systemic racism and things like that, but it's so much more than that. It's so much more than that. It's in everything. Like, again, going back to, like, the 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 main story. And, like, what we should be talking about. <laughs> yeah, yeah, kind of going on, a, a like, a massive Super tangents. Tangent. But, it just, but it just goes to show, like, this is the kind of mentality that is still so ingrained even 20 years after this like 20 23 years now since wow. this shooting happened it's like nothing's changed absolutely mm-hmm. nothing yeah. has changed and it's just you know you could go back further into the the history and you'd see repeated repeated incidents of you know an, an innocent an innocent black man being shot and killed because of what he's the the color of his skin like what is that like i just i don't i don't (laughs) yeah i literally can't wrap that around my head like the absolute worst part about that as well is like apparently one of the one of the four officers that shot amadou Mm -hmm. uh was implicated in another shooting just two years before that oh yeah where he shot and killed another black man like where where does it stop? Where does where does that cycle stop? Yeah. <laughs> like how do you right. stop it? Like that's 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 the, the main question. I think yeah. probably it starts at least with awareness. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. I think we're in the beginning stages of it because now in the age of social media, it's made it really hard for I guess things to get brushed under the rug as yeah. easily. Like you got to do more work to brush something under the rug. And even then, it's much harder now that I I don't know if it's. And People are paranoid about it too. Mm-hmm. Well, yeah, but I don't, I don't know if it's the same in every state, but a lot of, obviously, police officers are now required to wear body cams. Yeah. But yeah. even then, even without that, because we do have such easy access to recordings, any person can bring out a phone and start recording. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's... Could you imagine if Amadou was, like, recording that? Oh my, oh my god. god. Completely different scenario, I bet. Yeah. Uh, right, uh, right, uh, right. Articles really held on to the story of the 41 bullets, which is understandable because it is completely unnecessary for one man, but he was only recognized as a street peddler or just some poor person. In Freddy's words, he was otherized from day one. Frankie wanted to figure out who this guy was, what his story was, and for that said story to be told, and not for his life to have just been forgotten in the storm of everything. I'm sure you've heard of the George Floyd and Breonna Taylor situations. You've heard, like, the say their name sort of movement. This was similar. There's this media frenzy and whatever the most atrocious and crazy story that perks the interest is what's going to be plastered on the front of magazines and everywhere that I can see. But in the late 90s, early 2000s, Frankie was the voice initially trying to get the victim's name and story out there. This is why telling these stories is so important, beyond just the social implications of all of it, but for the victims who had their lives unfairly stripped of them to still receive the respect that they deserve. That is why I tip my buns to Frankie. Well, let's talk about another incredibly important player here, and that is Amadou's mother, Katia Tu. He left his culture, his family, his privilege. He left behind his good life for the dreams he had to make his family proud, but that was taken from him, taken from them. The day after the event, his mother receives a phone call from another relative of theirs living in New York about her eldest son. She was worried sick thinking something must have been wrong. Perhaps he was really sick or he could have been in the hospital. And then she was told that her son had been killed by the police nonetheless. She didn't believe it was real. He had no reason to have a problem with the police. She was surrounded with love at home after the news. However, she felt she had to get up onto her feet and go to America, go to the place her son was taken, and understand what really happened to him. She's so strong. Yeah. Uh, I just can't imagine, like, hearing that and just being so 
far yeah. from that place and it, it it wouldn't feel real i can right. imagine it just wouldn't feel real like you're on a plane driving somewhere going to this place knowing what you know and you just don't believe it right and not knowing like what the heck happened like how do you just yeah why get, well how do you just get killed by the by the people that are meant to protect you yeah how does the nicest friend or the nicest person you know just end up getting shot by the police that's so shocking because you know like what that's like think of the nicest person you know in your own life and then and then to hear something ugh. I'm sure they have like <laughs> their own maybe imbalances in power or something. I have no idea, but I'm pretty sure just culturally, culturally, that that would be a a big shock to say the least. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, but let's insert another face. However, I am not sure how I feel about this guy. This fella being Bennett Epstein, the defense attorney for Sean Carroll, who is one of the four cops. This lad delivers more information during that docu-series episode, and some perspective from the other side, I guess. I guess. <laughs> He mentions how with the media frenzy going on, all he sees is the number. The 41 shots and how these must be depraved killers and they must be trigger heavy cops, he says, but quote unquote, there are two sides to the coin. It's not wrong. He claims on the other side, these were scared cops. Turning back over to Frankie, he explains how these officers were in an unmarked car in plain clothes and you would have none the better idea that they were police until after they had stopped you. Frankie says, and I quote, And you knew that if you were a black or brown person, they could do or say anything in the name of protecting you. Another reporter mentions they're concerned about their practice of patrolling, trying to figure out why they targeted Amadou in the first place. She says it goes back to their training. They prepare for all sorts of threats all sorts of scenarios, but never for the possibility of innocence. Which really is a concept, huh? When you think about all the people in other situations who harp on the fact that people must be innocent until proven guilty. Yeah, it's such bullshit. It's not innocent until proven guilty. Right, either way, Amadou was assumed guilty immediately and had his right to have that proven being stripped from him on the spot. I hate that. Right. Mm-hmm. You'd think surely these guys were, at the bare minimum, fired? Nope. But thankfully, at least, the street crime unit was taken off said street patrol and put inside behind desks on desk duty. Let's also take a moment to say their names as well. Richard Murphy, Sean Carroll, Kenneth Boss, and Edward McMillan. Fuck you. Yep. <laughs> Fuck all <laughs> That's all I got to you. say for you. God. Yeah. You fucking suck. Thumbs down. Amadou Diallo's murders. Boy, do I want to make a comment on how white all of their names sound, but I know <laughs> that I probably shouldn't. <laughs> it's true, though. And of course, once these four fellas figured out that they could be held criminally responsible, they each got themselves a defense attorney. Supposedly, Sean Carroll was the one that thought he had seen a gun and initiated the shooting, followed by the other three. It is important to note Amadou Diallo's case wasn't the only one, of course. The excessive force or brutality by police against minorities had been and is still today an ongoing issue. A thousand people gathered for a vigil in front of his apartment, led by reverend and activist Al Sharpton. I want to shout this man out too because this is another hero. Reverend Sharpton served as a youth director in 1969 of the New York City branch of Operation Breadbasket, which helped African Americans obtain new or better jobs. He also founded the National Youth Movement in 1971 to raise resources for young impoverished people. Hell yeah, brother! In the following years, it appears he was involved in the activism of various race-related events, including that of Amadou's. He's a good man and put a foot forward to leading protests and marches and such in the name of equality and peace. While this story woke up activists and got them moving, it served as a wake-up call to the normal person as well, because despite facing this adversity in your day-to-day, -day, turning, turning a blind eye, now the reality was in your face. It was a wake-up call. And and finally, people felt it was time to fight back. So Amadou's mother makes it into New York and was immediately greeted by police. They told her that they would take <laughs> care of her, and from what I understand, they were kind of schmoozing her. They yeah, better be I kissing her ass. They were trying to oh, sweeten yeah. her up. They better. Be like, oh, yeah. We, look, we're so great. Like, oh, we are so yeah, sorry. Obviously, we didn't do anything wrong. This was an right. egregious mistake. Dickwads. 
This woman, the absolute goddess that she is, just immediately tells them that she needed to first go to the si to the scene where her son lived and died. For some reason, she was met with a bit of reluctance, but thankfully she stood her ground and they took her there. She gets there and in the documentary episode, you actually see footage of this, but this poor woman gets out of the car and is surrounded by reporters and what have you. Like, they are all up in her face. They really just have no respect. They really don't. Some people just don't know when to f stop. Right. It's all about, um, yep. It's all about that money. It's all about the big news story. All sensibility, yep, yep, yep. emotions, care goes right out the window. All she does is slump to her knees and wail <sighs> and crying out her baby's name. She continues on into his room, wanting to just feel him for one last time, I suppose. Having any sense of her son that she hadn't seen in two and a half years at that point. She picks up some of his clothes and is able to smell it even a bit of his scent. I do not think I could personally put into words how raw that is, and I really want to make it known that despite what she has gone through so far, she could easily choose a route of anger or violence, and she owes no one in the US a sliver of her respect or time. However, she takes the most dignified route imaginable. I love her, she's a queen. <laughs> In the car, yeah. she sees flashes of all the news people, the crowds, but what she sees would be Reverend Sharpton and asked who that was. Whoever was in the car explained who he was and that he was leading a rally on behalf of her son. And she says, I have to see him. I want to meet him. This lady, this poor lady, had no idea what was going on here. She was in a new place, in a new country, with a completely new culture, new ideals, etc. But most importantly, new politics and conflicts. But thankfully, Reverend Sharpton and that group of people had to step up and explain this to her, explain everything that was going on and why this resulted in the death of her son. The police force and Mary Giuliani had her in some fancy schmancy suite and the activist side was a bit afraid that they'd kind of lose her to the side of the police, but thankfully, however, this intelligent woman wouldn't stop asking questions. She wouldn't stop intelligently trying to discover the answer and ended up refusing the care and sponsorship of the state and went with the care of the activists and Sharpton so that they could get justice for her son. The African American community stepped up and donated, gave where they could, and held wherever they could for her. Heroes. <laughs> Rev Sharpton publicly thanked the city for their attempt to care for her, but ultimately said the people will take care of her. They believe without her turning down the sponsorship of the city, things wouldn't have looked as good for their side. The state could have labeled them as like basically troublemakers, or have not taken them as seriously, and could have just dusted over the incident as an accident. But by her taking a stand and beginning to speak up, they couldn't run that sort of narrative. For the first time, his mother took to speaking in public on National Action Network. Despite being a woman who has gone through the worst trauma and pain imaginable, and being in the face of so much turmoil due to said trauma, she is the most graceful being. She says, because of him, we are going to fight together to save all of our children. I can't imagine being someone there physically, where some woman from an entirely different country can come stand up and fight for a better America. She doesn't owe that to us. Nobody does. The sad part of that is, is that, again, just look back a couple of years ago. Not even, not even a couple of years ago. Look at everything that happened there. It's kind of like, it feels, it feels like almost futile for those people. And I feel awful for them. You know, she, his mother being like, let's stand up for everyone's children. And yet on a daily basis, basically a daily basis, another one is taken because of racial profiling. Uh, yup. It's so sad. It's so sad. Like, could you, could you imagine? Because they interviewed her again when dick face Derek Chauvin was uh, convicted with the murder of George Floyd. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, could you imagine like 20 years after your own son is taken from you by the police to find out that it's just happening again and again and again? Like how heartbreaking it must oh be, God, even though that's not her son at that point, you know? And just to right. see that like it feels like nothing's happened, just like you, like just like we've not commented, it feels like it's just the same stuff but it feels it doesn't feel like progress that should have been made has been made i, I would imagine that it feels so hopeless mm -hmm. you know yeah like her baby's death 
just keeps getting replayed. Nothing. Well, mm. yeah, and just just meant nothing. Yeah. yeah. You know, all that activism that they did then, like everything that they that she went through, having to deal with that media frenzy, everything, and that was back in like the late nineties, early two thousands. So you know, going they were through that, yeah, like go, yeah. going through all of that then, just to see it happening again in in 2020, 2021, like like how 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 do you make that up to a person? You know, you just you you can't. You can't. You just you can't. And that's that's the real like as tragic as it is for these people that are dying. The real tragedy is for the families that have to see another African American or black person or brown person, whatever. Any person of color being killed by the people that are meant to be helping them. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yep. And it just keeps on happening. And then it feels like no one's listening. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. It just feels like screaming into a void at that point. Yeah, I also want to shout out this woman because despite what you just said, she is still the most like graceful person. Like she has every that. right to be pissed off. She has every right to fuck off. You know? <laughs> But yeah. she's she's still she's still an activist. She still keeps her head up high, and I love her for it. I definitely couldn't have that much poise and grace to be like right? that. I would I be an absolute it's just, mess. It's it's having the mental fortitude as well. Yeah. To to still to shoulder keep this on fighting. Yeah. yeah. Atlas because would be jealous. Like, my God. <laughs> yeah. Right. Like, how do you see it happening or hear about it happening so often and just keep on being like, it'll get better, it'll yeah. get better, you oh, know? Oh, it's fine, yeah. It's it's and not, not, not a big even deal. It's, it's fine, but it'll, it'll get better. We'll keep on fighting, we'll keep on fighting. Mm-hmm. It just, like, I, I could imagine, like, it getting to a point of being like, where does this fight end? Right. You know? Mm-hmm. Like, it has to. It has to. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it's good though because, or her still fighting that fight is good though because like if she doesn't like, who is? She's definitely mm. got to be like probably she's probably a huge figurehead to a lot of mothers and just women who are going through this, like that are now in mm. her shoes. Like right. I'm sure that they are drawing strength from her as well. Yeah, I hope she knows that she's. She's a huge hero to a lot of people. Yeah, but I'm so sad that she had to be, though. Right. Like, she shouldn't have to be. Yeah, she shouldn't. (laughs) No one should have to be. All right, here comes some sadness. Are you ready? That wasn't sad. Uh Oh, boy. (laughs) Some some more sadness. (sighs) Buckle up. Buckle up. All right. (laughs) And so Amadou and his family have to return to Guinea. Two and a half years or so. Later, after leaving the people and the life that he had to pursue for a better life, he had returned. He had come home. But he had come home in a pine box. People who leave usually come back successful. He wanted to be something. He wanted to go home and teach others. Amadou's mother and family, Frankie the reporter, and Amadou himself, land from the airplane. Hundreds of people were gathered there, and someone seized the coffin. And it's described in the documentary episode as All hell breaks loose. It was as if the whole country was weeping. When a tragedy like this happens, people may think about the family or immediate community in terms of how they are affected, but I think we as American people might forget how something like this affects a whole community on a grander scale. If we were to send someone off to another country, and said person were killed there, I do not think America would take very kindly to said country. We'd probably label them as barbaric and a number of other unfair things, and probably take a pretty angered approach to responding to something like that. But we did that. We did that to another country's person. And even though we could be labeled as barbaric monsters, the first thing that they do is mourn and take care of each other. I'm sure each individual is different, but they treat each other as family and they take care of their own. We can't even say that for ourselves. As for Amadou's mother, even if she was crying or mourning behind the scenes, She was holding her head up high in front of others. Always. I cannot with words explain the dignity of this woman. She is a hero. (laughs) Really, at this point, the police and the state side of things aren't looking great, especially with the poison heroism coming from the activist side. The four police officers who shot and killed Abadou were charged with murder and reckless endangerment, and this case was going to trial. Thankfully, those clowns, instead of being on desk duty, were fully suspended by the police department during the trial. The indictment of the four policemen gave Kadiatu hope that justice and change would come to the city. 
All right, get ready to get upset. More upset. <laughs> I cannot. Oh, boy. Uh. <laughs> There's a scene from the documentary, right, where some reporter or what have you was outside of the courthouse, and one of the cops, Richard Murphy, said with the cockiest attitude, I did nothing wrong, and this trial will show that I did nothing wrong, and I'm looking forward to it. All smiles. You're a bitch. A lot of dick. And You're a bitch. man was taken from this world You like shot you. some- <laughs> Cannot speak for himself at the upcoming trial. And you're all smiles? I'm going mm. to lose my mind. I'm going to lose it. The little I had left. This is this is in my own words. Get ready for this. It's needless to say, and certainly these morons weren't helping their own case, but the media had quite a bit of negative publicity for the cops. There was an article that was led by the word bang 41 times. Not a good look, but at the same time, no shit. <laughs> 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 Listen, these absolute clowns and their clown defense lawyers weren't very fond of this, but with that many bullets showering down on a guy who probably had no idea what was going on, it's kind of necessary. And there's always this garbage argument like, just comply with the police and this sort of thing wouldn't have happened. But it's like, you've been in America for maybe two years, it's entirely possible him reaching into his pocket to grab his wallet with his ID could have been what he thought was complying. It's just absolute garbage no matter how you spin it. Ten shots per cop at one man was highly overdone. Scared cop or not. But no, they think it's not fair. So guess what happens? I'll let you go ahead, you guys. Guess what happens next? I... yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely nothing. I bet that the judge nothing is like, I'm oh, like. yes, this, yeah, the, my, my guess is that the judge is just like, oh, yeah, like, that's so reasonable. You were feared for your life. Dismissed. That's my guess. Cops actually, there are, um, I think it is, there is a law that protects police from being sued, I think it was. No, I can't remember. What? I had it and then I lost it. It was something like, <laughs> if what they're is that? doing something in the line of work. Then. That's some donkey <laughs> bullshit, America. Well, I can't explain America. <laughs> don't put that in on. Don't put that in unless I can verify it. <laughs> okay, okay, I can't, okay. <laughs> All right. Look, so put it in. That's some donkey don't. bullshit, America. <laughs> 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 Even if it's true or not. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, so here, here's what happened. They decided that a motion needed to be made for a change of venue because jurors of the Bronx tend to, quote unquote, harbor prejudice against cops, and that excessive negative publicity in the area surrounding this case would taint the jury pool. F off. I think that's interesting how they think mowing a man down with bullets isn't prejudice but somehow justifyingly not being a fan of your local police force because of their frequent racial profiling and brutality is hmm shocking. Yeah. <laughs> that is some bullshit. Just like, oh yeah, America. let me just be prejudiced and shoot shoot this dude 41 times because, you know, the color of his skin because that's what it boils down to. It's not like, oh yeah, like he's reaching into his pocket. He must have a gun. No, he was just like, this is a this is a black guy. Let me let me shoot the f out of him. Like, yeah, cool. Your racial prejudice is like way over, like is, is way more important than the racial prejudice or like not even racial prejudice, like the prejudice against the police that do this shit. Like no fucking shit, Sherlock. Like this does not take more than five brain cells to realize why there's such prejudice against police when you're pulling that. Like what the f Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> right. And you'd think that this change of venue motion would be absolute blogna. And as someone else said, how can the defense say that a murder committed here can't be judged fairly by the people who live here? But they got their response. And this was the uh, a screenshot of the legal document. Per curiam, the bedrock principle of our justice system is a defendant's right to be presumed innocent until found guilty at a fair and impartial trial. A pre-trial change of venue for the purpose of protecting the right to a fair trial is an extraordinary remedy reserved for the rarest of cases. The case of the four police officers accused of murdering Amadou Diallo is that rare case. That the trial was moved 140 miles away from where the sh shooting took place to Albany, New York. A place where the white population at the time was 89%. Motherfuckers! And the Bronx had a 19% white population. 
That is some bull uh -huh. shit. God, the legal system just makes me angry. Yes, bull this is nothing short shit. of an insult both to New York and Amadou's family. It was like a slap in the face, his mother explained, like moving the trial to a different world. 11 months after the incident, January 31st, 2000, the trial was held in Albany. The four cops were being tried for second degree murder, which would be 25 years to life if found guilty. The jury was six white men, two white women, and four African American women. Just want to oh, sprinkle in this quote from the prosecution. In the 1990s, in Bronx, Bronx County, in Albany County, or anywhere else, human beings should be able to stand in the vestibule of their own home without getting shot to death. As many trials go, the prosecution has to prove that there was intent to kill and therefore was murder. As a bystander said outside the courthouse in the documentary, they were hunting that evening, and unfortunately, the prey was Amadou Diallo. And I think that really nails it. They were patrolling a poor black neighborhood for someone who looks stereotypically criminal to them. Diallo was in a confined small space by himself at his home and had no choice but to take on the shots the cops fired. At this point, their side looks pretty solid. How is the, the defense? going to justify all 41 of those shots. Outside, people were protesting non-stop. Supposedly, you could hear it from inside, adding to the stress of the defense. They had only one route to go if they wanted a not guilty verdict, and that was to play towards empathy, towards human emotion. And that they did, and apparently they did it well, supposedly. I don't know if I agree, but that's, that's what people thought. One of the cops, <laughs> <laughs> Crocodile tears on his face said, I said, oh my god, I just held him, held his hand, I rubbed his face, please don't die. And then he choked up after that, sobbed it into his hands with the tissue. And personally, I don't know if I could really believe it, because having empathy after destroying a man and the so entrance you're... of his home doesn't really fit to me, but regardless. Let's turn to what Katia too thought. She said, My son was being tried. He was dead. He couldn't speak for himself. The prosecution didn't even speak about who he was. And so she walked out. She was right though. The prosecution had to prove that these men were looking for a kill. Or the defense had to prove that Amadou was somehow intimidating or a threat and that they were protecting themselves from him. No one was talking about who he was. And I don't blame her. She says in front of press outside, they continue to maintain Amadou as suspicious. How can you suspect someone standing in front of his own door where he lives? A supporter runs up behind her and says, Miss Diallo, please be strong. You're standing for us too. Don't let go. Don't give up. She was called back to the courthouse. She collected herself and came back in. Man. And the result is not guilty. <laughs> Acquitted on all charges, including yeah. reckless endangerment. F like, the thing that, that really pisses me off about that is like, the guy's like, I held his hand, I stroked his hand, I said, please don't die. After you No one's gonna stroke trigger, his face! Like, not, not just that, but like, after shooting your gun 10 times because like realistically like each one of those cops must have pulled the trigger at least 10 times like each one of them because unless one of them was extremely trigger happy and unloaded because like most handguns would like around 10 10 bullets in a in a magazine like sometimes they hold like a, a like a couple more than that but it's very rare that uh, a, a handgun holds more than like say 12, 12 bullets. So unless one of those cops went extremely fucking trigger happy, shot all of their shots, reloaded and carried on shooting to make up for the, the amount of shots that the other guy must not have shot because he was in so shock, so much shock that he didn't want this person to die. Like that's fucking horseshit. That's absolute horseshit. There's no way, there's no way. Like just from like a numerical standpoint, someone must have like would have had to have reloaded if one person had like the moral fiber to realize, oh shit, like this might be a bit too much. That doesn't, right. that doesn't make sense. Each one of them was absolutely complicit and knew exactly what they were doing when you pulled the yeah. trigger 10 times. I think if hold it, him saying him holding him is, I don't believe it. I don't believe That's it for no. a second. Overkill. No, no, absolutely not. Right. I guarantee that they all stood over his body. Right, I guarantee. I bet it. you. They I bet you. One of them probably would have been like, "Oh shit, dude, we we might have we might have fucked up," or like laughed about it or, or something. Yeah, absolutely. Yep, yeah, without a, a doubt. Without a doubt, about. they would have. Yeah, yeah, they would have made a, a joke about it because you've seen it before with like other other police 
incidents where they start like joking about like shit that they just pulled that's completely illegal. Like after and something's like, just are happened. People overreacting. Yeah, they just like, murdered a man. Why are they screaming? Yeah, it's just like that's such <laughs> bullshit. Absolute bullshit that they pulled that and right. saying yeah we we. Like, I, I was so upset. And it's like, my dude, Were there you, was <laughs> no... Yeah, exactly. Like, you can't be. You just actively chose. Like, even if you're working on instinct, uh, all I know is, is like, one bullet is fucking enough to put a man down. Like, the average person. Unless they are, like, hopped up on some drug and they are, like, fucking roid raging, one bullet is enough to put a, a regular, regular person down. Like, in the leg, in the arm, you know, somewhere non-lethal. But like 41 shots, 19 connections. Like they, they would have known after the second bullet hit that, that that guy wasn't getting back up. That guy was probably dead before they finished pulling the triggers, realistically. Because like the, the type of bullets that they were using, as I said, as I said, was hollow points. Like that well, not hollow points, they were they were full full metal jackets, sorry. And those are, are meant to to penetrate through body armor. They're like military Jesus. like now they are military grade bullets bullets they are then not used by the average person because they do shred through metal plates like that's what they were designed for Jesus. you know so like how how they can justify that and pull that that all that bullshit is just yeah like i yeah. wouldn't like yeah i i i wish that they would go back on trial for it i wish but i bet you they were they were uh it was it was probably thrown out well not thrown out but it was probably dismissed with impunity so that way it can never go back to to court again katia too says understandably it was like saying to me that my child caused his own death in the end, it was not about Amadou. In the spirit of Amadou, that I ask for your calm and prayers. She didn't want riots in response. She wants unity and justice. The grace of this woman. I'm going to share the concluding thoughts from Frankie in that documentary because I think that they're very important to share. He says, at its core, racism is about fear. They don't see us as fully formed human beings. I don't know how you can prove racism in the court of law, but did we need to prove that to get justice for someone who is standing standing in his doorway and was shot at 41 times. And so this justification for fear of the black man in the corner continues today. Let that sink in. <laughs> Man, I just can't get over the fact that even if you strip literally all context away, just the fact that someone was shot in the doorway 41 times by multiple people is just scary. It doesn't like... You sh uh it, that's like a mob hit at that point. Yeah, that yeah. feels just like it you just know, feels that like feel they were looking for trouble and they found like a reasonable outlet, which I don't like thinking because I don't want to think that the police are corrupt and everything like yeah. that. Yeah. But I'm realistic enough to know that it does happen, and I just hate it getting brushed under the rug. Like just, just like the like the image in my head right now of what happened, just like reminiscent of of Scarface, you know. Like the scene where he's standing at the top of his, of his balcony and he has like a dozen dudes with like fully automatic guns shooting him. Like dozens of them. That's like the kind of like vibe that I get from like this, the these police officers. Like four dudes with guns shooting at a single guy that wasn't even armed. Wasn't four even dudes. armed. Mm -hmm. yeah. Bullshit. So more, most importantly from all of that, I would like to say, uh, please remember Amadou who came to the United States to succeed and never got the chance. And I'm also going to hit you guys with some, some updates of sorts. Since this happened in 99 in the early 2000s, let's talk about where things are right now. The street crime unit in New York was disbanded in 2002 after a federal investigation prompted by the shooting of Amadou found that the unit engaged in racial profiling. After the not guilty verdict of the Amadou trial, Edward McMillan and Richard Murphy joined the New York Fire Department. Sean Carroll and Kenneth Boss somehow returned to the police department and are now retired. In 2004, the Diallo family settled a civil suit with the New York City for $3 million. Katia Tu Diallo started the Amadou Diallo Foundation, which provides community outreach and scholarships for students aspiring to head to a higher education. She continues to speak out and advocate on behalf of families impacted by police-related violence. I don't know how this wasn't brought into 
the trial, but one of the officers involved in the killing of Amadou, Kenneth Boss, was involved only two years earlier in another killing of a black man. That man was Patrick Bailey, who like Amadou was only 22 at the time. Kenneth and three other police officers responded to a call by another man that Bailey was intimidating him with a gun. When they arrived at the scene, they claimed he did in fact have a gun, and when he spun around to confront the police, Officer Boss shot him twice. Another officer supposedly fired but missed. Way less than the 41 shots at Abadou, but alas. It was discovered at the scene that the gun Bailey had was inoperable and unloaded. And according to the family, they said there were witnesses that claimed that he did not have a weapon and think that the gun was found in the building and planted where he was shot at by police. After Amadou's trial, Kenneth was reassigned to desk duty, but in 2012, his ability to carry a firearm was restored. He was then promoted to sergeant in 2015. All of that is nothing but bullshit. Fucking <laughs> cunt. I just want to go on a rampage. I know, doesn't that just... It just boils me my piss. Like, legitimately boils my piss <laughs> like holy shit steams I'm, your hands i'm looking at the crime scene photos right now i don't like it for which um i do not like all the like the full crime scene just like where they have plastic cups set up where all the shots were out and the <gasps> police officers are out ghouls <laughs> 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 share the link Oh my god, it makes me feel sick because they just- Well, just, uh, look up- go If you Google Amadou Diallo scene, it pops up in Google Images. Oh my god. Oh my god. Yeah, right. it's so f up. I've seen, like, the, the- the doorway and, like, how it was all, like, shredded to pieces, but- mm -hmm. Jesus. Yeah. There's- Oh yeah, there's the- there's the cups. I see that. Mm -hmm. That must have been where all the shells were. Yeah. What the hell? There's so many. I want to cry. Right? <sighs> it's in inhumane. It's f***ed up. <laughs> Point blank, it's f***ed up. Yeah, that's a shame. Can you see the image of the, the door frame where it's just like splintered where one mm -hmm. of the bullets hit? Yeah. Like, imagine that going through flesh. Yeah, yeah. And they have ones just on the concrete where it dented like metal or the stone. Blech. Yeah. What the f***? Yeah. How is that yeah. safe to carry for like pedestrians? Like, I'm just yeah. So that's my point. Like from from earlier, one or two of those hitting somebody, two at most, would down. put the average person down. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So you know, you, or you just or or like says like you know you need to hit a person once and that's it. That's it. You don't. You wouldn't have needed to hit them more than that. So the fact that they fired forty one and hit nineteen. Nearly 50% of the shots fired hit him. There is no fucking way in any reality that that man was alive by the time that they were done shooting. No fucking way. Like, disgusting right. that they got away with that. And, like, this hurts. They, couldn't they have, like, Just chased him or something? It. If they really they could have done so much. They could yeah. have done so much, but their I was first say, instinct is just to shoot. I don't know how common it would have been back then to have tasers in 1999. I, because mm. obviously, like back then, I wasn't, I wasn't old enough to really comprehend the gravity of things. Anyway. Yeah, same. Um, so I don't know, like. There were stun uh, guns. Sorry, I googled it. Yeah, I was gonna say when, when did... <laughs> specifically, I googled. I mean, yeah, tasers. Yeah, I was gonna say like tasers. Well, they were they were introduced in 1993, oh. but I don't know whether that was like why do you and those are I think they're mostly like the I know they're the the proper ones like the ones with the darts that come out. Um, yeah, so like the, there's the prongs oh, that come out oh. and go into people. Where, yeah, because yeah. there's two different types. Because there's you've got the stun gun style, which is like you have to be super close to someone and zap them, yeah. and then you've got the actual ones that fire out the barbs. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I don't I don't know how commonplace they were in 1999. Yeah, Common enough because apparently uh, John Benet Ramsey was killed in what 96, and there were marks on her face and back that they speculated are from a taser. Mm. I only brought that up because I was listening to it earlier. <laughs> yeah. 
I just, I don't like this. I it mean, makes me feel awful, and I can't even begin. The, the thing that makes me the most upset is I can't even begin to understand, like, the depth of that. You know, because, right. like, as a white woman, I will never have to deal with the pressures that, like, a black woman would have. Or, like, a black man, you know. I, that's just not something I'm going to understand. But I can understand that this is disgusting. Yeah. I can understand that this is not how you treat just people that are standing around. Right. I, I don't like that there's just really reactive police officers. And the first yeah. thing that their reaction is to do is to shoot. Because I understand that they could think that there's like a gun, but at the same time, they're trained to know like what to do in that kind of situation. Yeah. Well, you think that they're trained. They're, they're supposed, supposed to be to, trained. Yeah. I'll put that. I'll say that. Supposed to. <laughs> you would think you're supposed to be trained, but it kind of, it, it does beg the question of like, what kind of training do they actually go through? I think you know, I, and is it and oh, is it different? It. Is it is it different in every like district or whatever like precinct? Is it, it can, is it different? Like very, do, it can vary by state and county. Yeah, like, like if it's um if it's like a, a more rural county, you can be a police officer like right out of high school if you go through um the training camp, which I think is like six months or something. like Six that. months? Is yeah, that it's like six it? months. Yeah, yeah. What for a police fuck? officer here, I'm gonna hold on. I'm gonna Google it really quick so I'm get my facts right. Um. Because I was going to say here, like I, so little, little known fact about me back in, in my young years, after deciding that I did not want to be an English teacher because fuck that, um, I thought, oh yeah, I might want to join the police force. That's like, that was my next train of thought because why not? Um, and to do that, I would have had to go through at least a two year course before I would have been able to get like the most entry level position as a, as a street, street cop, essentially. Like the most like basic. And even then, street cops here don't get to carry f***ing firearms. Okay, I found it. So the first step is you have to have a high school diploma or a GED. Um, they may prefer applicants with a bachelor's or associate's degree or a certain number of post-secondary education credits, but it's not required. So basically, um, if you can w mm -hmm. work at a Walmart, then you're good. You can work as a police officer, got it, all right. <laughs> Most applicants will need to be a U.S. citizen, have a valid driver's license, and be at least 18 or 21 years old. Why just put 18? Whatever. Depending on department policy, applicants will also need to a clean criminal record, although some police departments may allow those with criminal records as long as their offenses were very minor. Felonies will disqualify someone in, from this profession. Obtain a bachelor's degree, optional. A bachelor's degree is usually needed for more advanced law enforcement positions, especially those at federal level level, such as with FBI or U.S. Fish and Wildlife Services. Even if not required, police departments are increasing, beginning to look favorably, increasingly beginning to look favorably on applicants with college degrees. And then you have to play, uh, pass the law enforcement exam. So essentially, Oh, okay, so wait. Before being admitted into a police academy, applicants must achieve a passing score on an entrance exam. The exact entrance exam taken will depend on the police academy and jurisdiction. Some of the tests given include asset, compass, and LEE, law enforcement exaggerated. examination. Um, How long is the academy course? It is six months. The police academy is where applicants receive the most important training that will allow them to serve as police officers. Training can last six months with a curriculum covering such topics as uh, search and seizure, criminal statutes, traffic laws, firearm training, driving training, and physical conditioning. And that's it. So what you're telling me is, what you're telling me is, the same person that can get a job at a Walmart can just go and become a police officer? Well, I mean, like, I saw guns at training. Walmart. I, I know. <laughs> This is the first step. What do you mean? But like the same, yeah. like the same level of education, mm -hmm. and like you, I, yep. I just, uh, yeah, yeah. You like can that roll makes... straight out of high school into law enforcement if you were in. Um, there's this kind of um, what's it called? What? 
not is a that degree, but bullshit? <laughs> That's such uh, horseshit. As I said, like it's like two years that you have to then study before you're you're even like eligible to get a position, and that's if you you get a position. You still have to apply to a police force at that point. You do two years before before you even get like considered, and that's that's not even considering like if you want to go into like a very specific force. Like if you wanted to go into um like the the Met Police and be in the Armed Response Unit, which means that you do get to handle guns in in emergency situations. You could do two years basic, and then if you wanted to do that, you have to go on and do. I think it's another four years afterwards. Nope, you don't do that here. What I was wondering when um when all the George when George Floyd stuff first happened, I was looking into what it takes to become a police officer, and I saw this. And then someone had brought up a good point, and someone was like, "Why does it take law students seven years to learn the law, and police officers who are supposed to be enforcing that law don't even?" technically need a year in some cases. What the fuck? But si six months. Six Bruh. months. That's horseshit. That actually reminds me, there was a video that I saw uh, the other day. I can't, I can't remember when, but essentially it was, it was based in, I think it was in Texas. And there was a, a black guy and his, uh, I think his girlfriend was there as well. And these two police officers had stopped them and started trying to um, arrest him for failure to provide ID. Um, what the that's what they were they were going to try and arrest him for. What a bitch. And this this guy, and I was like, I I respected the absolute f out of him. This guy was like, there there's a there's a specific thing that you need to do if you want to do uh, like if you want to try and arrest me for failure to prove ID, and I'm not doing any of it. And he he quoted it he was like it's this section of the law and it's like give me give me my phone and like the, the girlfriend passed in his phone and he <laughs> he googled it there and then like the exact thing and started reading it and he's like i'm gonna educate these fools right yes. now and like to both <gasps> the police officers and started reading it out to them and it was just like that's such a Got like how much of a head f to think like you as a citizen have to know the law better than mm -hmm. the people that are enforcing the law yeah like there what was a the f bruh. yeah there was a video i saw where um this guy got pulled over and he was actually a lawyer and the cop came up to him and it was like um he said something about some law that didn't exist oh he stopped him for like a traffic reason i think but he was trying to say that the lawyer like guy couldn't report couldn't record him oh yeah and i've seen that um it, yeah he, and he just he, he owns the cop yeah, oh my yeah, god yeah, yeah. get school he's bitch. he's um he's uh uh he does like part-time uber driving as oh, well like he's, he's he's a lawyer but he's a part-time uber driver and what happened there is that he got pulled over because of his passenger mm. the the passenger he had right, oh, uh, like right driving was yeah 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 uh he had like, had, like some kind of suspicion yeah, yeah 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 and they wanted like search his car and everything they were like telling him to stop recording that it was illegal for him to be recording ah. it was like what part of the law tells me that i can't record this tell me and he was like tell me and like he's, he's like, like yeah me, i'm a lawyer know. <laughs> and they were like, oh, Oops. shit. And like, the, you hear the tone change. Yeah. And, that, yep. and like, the, the funny thing is, is, like, that was that was still with a white guy. Let alone, yeah. like, if that had been a black dude, like. Right. Yeah. That right. would have been, like, he would have been. Bruh. They would have just Bruh. pulled out their gun and shot him there and then. Get They're resisting arrest. Get on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Bruh. Exactly. Like, he, that guy was just fortunate that he was a white guy. Because I bet you, I bet any. Bruh amount of money even if that if it were a black guy and he were recording they would have shot him taken his phone and just Bruh. destroyed it they would have done Guaranteed something it, it yeah would, i don't think it would have played out like that I, sure. it would have it would have it gone that have way nice. one way or another well, it, it might not have been escalated that quickly but like i guarantee Bruh. it because you hear about it you've like it's been mm. on the news even over here about like cops in america that have just like pulled over black people and just shot them mm. in their car because they have not like complied with them in the slightest way like right. oh put your hands on the on the the steering wheel oh right. you didn't do it within three seconds bang but now now you're dead like what yeah. sense is that in yeah, any I tell you guys world about this article i saw the other day oh what 
it was on my phone, so it was something like to the effect of Democrats must stop their violence against police or something like that. Oh yeah, yeah. you said yeah. I remember you telling Oh my god. It's what? like bruh <laughs> Must stop their violence against the police. Shut We have the opposite problem, yeah. Absolute mm. ding dongs. Opposite problem. Just yeah. the tone deafness of it all. Also, it really I mean a lot of a lot of people have gripes like, oh, the, the American way is such and such. The American way is that you should have your right to stand up to police if you so feel felt the need, right? Right. Absolutely. Like if your rights are being infringed on by a police officer, you absolutely should and could have the ability to stick up for yourself. Mm -hmm. yeah. Like that's that's not the American way for them to silently mow down people and get away with it. That's. That's it not the American like way. That's why no. we have the Second Amendment. You have the Second Amendment and the First Amendment. Well, the First Amendment as well. Like you, you guys have freedom of uh, freedom of speech. Mm -hmm. Like I know that, like technically speaking, like freedom of speech only applies to when you're like essentially like criticizing government or whatever. But police are, as far as I'm I'm aware and as far as I'm concerned, should be under like governmental like control, right. like local well, government, public whatever. Yeah, they're, they're public servants, but that's under the the local governments, right? Like, th ultimately, the, it's the funding from whatever local government is funding the police, right? Mm. You know, so as far as I'm concerned, that is a governmental thing. So you should, by all right, be able to have freedom of speech, even when it comes to a police officer, as long as that speech is reasonable, not not fueled with hate, etc., etc. Like the the normal things of freedom of speech. If you can talk like an adult. Yeah. But apparently, if, it only works one way, think, and it's, yeah, it's the apparently police's if you're way a white or the highway. Person. Yeah, yeah. If you're a white person or if you're a police officer, it's either it's your way or the highway. Right. Apparently, yeah. you know. And this is coming from a guy whose country does not have freedom of speech laws. Just saying. <laughs> Just for right. saying. Horseshit. You guys sound more free than we do. Um, yeah, yeah. Like I can, like if I if I walked out into my street now, given that it is like kind of late at night, I could walk out into my street. I could like walk into a police officer. Not that there are any around here, because surprisingly there isn't a massive amount of crime. I can walk out there and I could like go up to a police officer, like without them knowing that I was like approaching them, and be like, oh hey, excuse me, can I? And I could start a conversation with them exactly like that without fear of being shot and that right. like that wouldn't matter if i was a black person or a white person asian any ethnicity at all that would not matter i could go out and do that safely without fear for my life whereas even like like even as a, a, as a white person like the idea of being in america and like having to approach a police officer like kind of like w would terrify me even even as a white person just because like it's such a different world of how things are done there like they they may not like be violent against me but how would they treat me if i went up and started speaking to them you know like mm -hmm. yeah. it's it's just such a different world it's just like you it's like its own little weird bubble tv reality show over there that's so <laughs> self-contained like it just like it, it just seems so unreal like so fictional it yeah. doesn't how feel things real. happen yeah it's like just, it does but it doesn't it's it's it wild yeah. i don't know why but this kind of reminds me of the person who shortly shortly after lockdown like stood on top of cars in a by me and um <gasps> oh, yeah shot himself but that was after spewing some crazy conspiracy stuff and it's like i don't it's, there's so many people just it's i don't know mind-boggling how like out of touch yeah and, like, there's like just like a lack of yeah there's just like a lack of like a grasp on reality mm -hmm. you know it's just I don't, I, it, it boggles my mind, absolutely boggles my mind, like, I do, do not understand, like, how, how it, it, it became like that, yeah. like, at all, it's just, yeah, yeah, like an alien planet, almost, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <for real. laughs> like, we're so, we look similar, but, oh my god, you guys are, you guys are kind of wild, are what the crazy over there. <laughs> Y'all good over there? No. <laughs> Just a bunch of screaming. <laughs> Y'all good over there, America? No. <laughs> half of America, need some no. Help. Other half of America. Bruh. Pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. Pretty much. Yeah. Jesus. Any any closing thoughts, you two? 
think I've, I've pretty much said like everything I need to say like through the video <laughs> and throughout the course. I'm just those cops are cunt. disappointed. <laughs> And I feel like they should each take a. It's, it's not quite quite as satisfying, but those they each one of them should take a ten shots from a, a non-lethal gun at, a, at about the same range. Mm. That that seems reasonable. I think that seems fair. Hey, balls you know to what? the balls. Yeah. I I would assume that this would already be a thing, but if it isn't, I really think that people in positions of authority like that should have to go through like special kind of like racial profiling training or well, you'd think you would think that's already think. part of it <laughs> yeah you would think you know can, can i share a little a little story with yeah. y'all yeah. oh there in one of my graphic design classes i don't remember exactly which we were going through like i, I guess it was kind of like how through the use of graphic design and advertising and things of that nature, pretty much racial pro profiling has been pushed, or just like racism in general. And we had like this entire, we watched a documentary and like had some discussions. It was pretty much about how like African American people of color, etc., have been like portrayed through American media throughout the years. And like you, I would assume that you as an American person would know to some degree, like, oh yeah, there's, there's definitely been some racist things. But there are some things in that documentary that actually actually kind of like shook me and made me really upset. I don't know that I cried necessarily, but I think it's pretty cry-worthy material. And some of those things are like, they would portray uh, dark-skinned people as being like stupid or incapable of doing basic things. Like, and this was just like the norm. And then as stuff progressed, I believe through media, they like pushed this like the whole poverty and drug and crime things like onto them. Whereas, because like, I feel like a lot of people who are on the cusp of racism but like don't want to admit it to themselves or don't really understand or something are like, well, in my experience, you know, black people are like violent or they, they live in poor neighborhoods and, and you get involved with a lot of bad stuff like drugs and crime and etc etc. But it's like they never had a fighting chance to begin with. Mm -hmm. They were they were kind of like corralled into these lifestyles. And yep. we're at a place where a lot of us is like, it's been like that long before we were, we've been, even been alive. To the point mm -hmm. where it's like, you don't even question it a whole lot. Cause like- I mean, all you have to do is kind of look back to, when was it like the, was it the the 30s? Uh, I can't remember when it was, was it Maria Parks? Was that Rosa her name? Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks, sorry, yeah. <laughs> when, yeah, like the whole, the whole bus situation, you know? Like right yeah. there, that in itself was just like a form of, well, as a, like the best way of putting it is like kind of casual racism, you know? Like, yeah. oh, you look different, you can sit at the back of the bus. You know, like mm -hmm. that's that's what it is. And that's what I think a lot of people don't understand is mm -hmm. like, it's not like that there is a sliding scale of racism. And a lot yeah. of people think that because that they're not like the hardcore racist, you know, we're not KKK, you know, that, you know, oh yeah, saying, saying a thing that's racially insensitive isn't, isn't racist. Yeah, it is. Of course it is. Right. That's still racism. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what you think it is or not that's still racism it may not be the worst form of racism you may not be going out and trying to lynch a mother but <laughs> that's still racism yeah it's yeah i've had like, a similar discovery myself in like the past 10 years and i don't know if that's just because like i went through elementary school and middle school and what have you in the south but i discovered like because i thought or at least it was portrayed to me that racism is just when you outright just hate a person based on their like skin color or what have you, their ethnicity, and like actively want to bring them harm or something like that. Where I learned as I got older and more informed and educated, I suppose it, it it's it's way more deep rooted. It's way more deep rooted than that. And you, I think like I think a large amount of Americans think that way. If that makes sense, because like you you've probably heard the phrase like I'm not racist, but you yeah. know, mm -hmm. insert insert phrase. It's like, buddy, that's that's still that's racist. Exactly, so like, yeah. I'm not racist because I have a black friend. Like, they don't understand that racism doesn't have to be that extreme. It could still be on a smaller scale. Yeah, yeah. that's one of the things. Like, there was a, a fantastic um, like study that was done. Um, I can't remember the the lady's name uh, off the top of my head, but essentially, uh, she's I think she was a U.S. professor um, who had been kind of like 
delving into like racism and things like that and she came over here because uh british people tend to think that they're very not racist um and often declare declare ourselves as the least racist country on the european continent <laughs> um and essentially she started like educate well not educating but giving them like these hypotheticals and things like that and the amount of people like oh yeah no that's not racist and it's like my guy it yeah, is that is my guy <laughs> yeah yeah right and it was my just dude. like yeah it's just like that is that is racism like, right there <laughs> yeah and it's just amazing how many people like even over here think that like the sim similar train of thought of like oh no it's not racist because i don't mean any like ill intent behind it and it's like well that's that's good that you don't mean any ill, Ill, Ill intent behind it but it doesn't make it any less racist <laughs> like mm -hmm. that's that doesn't doesn't matter how you feel about it it's like how do how do the people that you are talking about feel about it exactly right. that's what dude <laughs> I like, heard I heard someone say like the N word around me before, and I was like, "What the f was that?" Yeah, and he was like, "Well," and I was like, "Don't you have like black friends and things like that?" And he's like, "Well, yeah." And I was like, "How would they feel if they heard you just now?" Yeah, and he's like, "Oh, okay, may maybe." I was yeah. like, "Yeah, no, that's fucked up." <laughs> yeah, I don't stand for that. Do not, please. No. no. And like to to kind of like flip flip the script a little bit because like again us being you know white people mm -hmm. it's like we we generally don't feel like racial prejudice against us yeah generally speaking but I remember when I lived in London um, I lived in an area that was predominantly black people mm. um, and one there was one day I was I was going to work and I was wait, waiting for a bus and you know it's all all good and everything and i get on the bus and like it's mostly black people which i you know expect because it is a heavily black area and i'm like okay yeah whatever and i you know i pay pay my bus fare and i'm like putting my stuff where i'm about to walk like to go get to a seat and every single black woman on that bus was just staring at me oh every single one of them and i was like oh is is that what that feels like because that's that's horrid. Oh like, yeah, I've been there too. When everyone just there. stops and stares at you for no reason. You're like, yeah. what? No, I mean like, yeah. like, I went through something really similar where when I was in elementary school and my, my bus ride or whatever, especially in the morning, was legitimately, I'm fairly certain, all, all black kids. And I was the only white kid. And not only were they all staring at me, but they like actively did not like me. And they were like, like this bus was crowded and I'm talking like two to two to three to most seats and I was like oh, the last one to get on oh. and even though that I barely had a place to figure out where to sit as it was like they would actively like try to fill up the seats and make it so I couldn't sit with them and it feels really horrible yeah <laughs> yeah and it's a good feeling it, it's it, it, I, it's I can't shit. even put it into words especially like when you've already got shit going on and you know that like you brace yourself every day to just put up with that and then go to school and get something similar for like seven eight hours a day and then come home and like do it all again it's like it's like having ants in your skin i guess like the anxiety i cannot describe and like to live your life like that like it's no as, as way a, to live as a as a black person where i'm sure if they were in a flip scenario it'd be much worse than i oh yeah because i remember absolutely. being afraid i remember like because like some of them just would threaten to kick my ass just for me existing <laughs> and i mean kids are shitty no matter like like where you are, who, who you are, I'm pretty sure. But it's, I don't know, to, yeah. to, to amplify that feeling, especially when you're like an adult, because mm -hmm. children are shitty, but they're children and you, you kind of don't know any better. I mean, you kind of do, but I guess kids are going to be shitty. But if you're an adult and you're in a position like, I just can't. Yeah. I can't. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. honestly, like that was that was the first like real, that was like the real eye opener for me. Yeah. It's like, you know, I, I wasn't, I was an adult. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't a kid or anything like that. I got on this bus and it was all adults and just every single eye turned, turned to me. And I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, that's what that feels like. Yeah. It's, it's a real really not good feeling. <laughs>
No, no. But then, like, imagine having that essentially every single goddamn day of your life. Yeah, literally because that's no what, break. Yeah, that's that's what I I imagine. Obviously, I can't speak for for black people, but I imagine that's that's what it is for a lot of them. That's mm-hmm. what I I yeah. imagine like having that feeling every single day, and it's just you know. And knowing that there's literally no like good place for you because it's everywhere. It's on the media. It's yeah. <laughs> in the doors, outside the doors, everywhere. No, it's wild. <sighs> like I couldn't. Yeah, I, I can't even like begin to fully comprehend what it would be like to be in that situation. Right. You know. And like, like that's just like one one aspect of it. That doesn't even go into like things like like getting a job or anything like that, you know, because that's that's more difficult because of the color of your skin, you know? For real. I, Man, getting jobs and education and such, oh my God, that's an argument for another day because I could bitch for hours. But people oh yeah. still to this day are like convinced that the playing field is completely even and no. it's not. No. And it makes me so mad. <laughs> No, uh, it's 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 not. There is so much racial inequity. Yeah. It's not going to change anytime soon because there are people in power all around the world that don't give a shit. Correct. You know? Can't make sh- change on something if the people that are supposed to make that change don't don't give a shit. So, I guess my takeaway from the situation is please give a shit or at least educate yourself. I guess even just more people having the the perspective in their heads could even be like a step in the right direction. <laughs> yeah. Lead okay. lead by example and make a better future for the like next generations because yeah. that's where that's where it's going to start, you know. Our, our our generation is already too too late. It's already <laughs> I don't think like, it's too late. It, as much as change. much as I like, like it sounds dramatic, but it's it's true. Like it's too late oh, for yes. our generation to make like a meaningful difference because we are already like so divided from our parents and their ideologies mm. and and to like to like our ideologies like there are people that are brainwashed by their their parents and how they are to continue the cycle as it yeah. were so it's up to it's it really is up to the future generations and like the few few people that do try to make a difference now to educate them and make make it better because that's the only way it will happen all right thank you ghouligans for listening to our first going baddie episode of sorts sorry if that was difficult we definitely want to hear your thoughts on the subject so give us your comments below all links and socials will be below be sure to check them out and give a little subscribe and a bell tickle boy for more of our spoopy and true crime shenanigans also also feel free to recommend us some story topics and what have you all of that is more than welcome if you need my dms are also open for any of your suggestions your ideas your comments all that kind of stuff thank you guys so much again we really appreciate you and we'll see you in the next one